So we'll touch on now when you get captured. 190 days beaten. Didn't know if you're going to make it or not. Like, how did that start? Well, that that started. Um, backstory was I've uh, been re retired from operations, world military and intelligence for over ten years now. All of a sudden, a year ago, I started getting telephone calls from brigadier generals, colonels, some very senior members of the Afghan establishment. So some of these people I know like very very well. They're my close friends. Also got contacted by my former interpreters, my dr drivers, and they were panicking. They were stuck in Afghanistan. They couldn't get out. It's a year anniversary now, but you think about a year ago, it was absolute chaos in Afghanistan. Everyone thought there was going to be mass executions, just not good. So everyone was scrambling to get, get out of Afghanistan. Unfortunately, not everyone was able to get out of Afghanistan. I decided to go and help get some of the families out that I actually knew. The families in question had young children, some of them as young as two, four, six, and eight years old. And the idea was go out there for a couple of months, keep it quiet, get as many people out as we can. And that was it. Then it turned out that the numbers were phenomenal. So we ended up staying there a lot longer. Um, I was there for nine months in total in Afghanistan for th th three months over the evacuation. Then after three months, just as an absolute fluke, one morning I was picked up by literally myself and my colleague were looking at, at a house that we were thinking about renting. Some another Taliban tribe came up to us, all carrying AK 47s heavens, wanted to see our identification, who who we actually were. Pulled out my British passport. I had an entry stamp in there as well, so I was in the country 100 percent perfectly clean. We had a letter of the Chambers of Commerce, other identification as well. All 100 percent real, spot on. So there shouldn't have been any problems there. They wanted us to accompany them to their intelligence headquarters in Kabul, which was literally around the corner at this point. So we weren't arrested. So we voluntarily accompanied them to their to their headquarters to answer any other questions. And basically, after a couple of hours, we thought they're going to check the ID, make sure it's real. I, I understand that. Um, we got put in a holding cell, expected to be there a couple of hours. 190 days later... We were released. Uh, we were taken to the airport, put, put onto a plane, and we were able to leave Afghanistan. 190 days in an underground Taliban interrogation centre. <clears throat> that was emotional. Um, they didn't have a clue who I was for the first two, two weeks. We just got pulled because we had British passports and they wanted to get some hostages. So we were actually political hostages once they an element within the t t taliban i'll call it a more extremist element within the taliban found out who i actually was then it got very interesting at that point because the interrogator had had a running with british soldiers years earlier in the south of afghanistan so he hated anything that was Br british military or anything and me being a form of veteran and a lot of the work i've done um it didn't help it so i ended up getting um quite badly beaten or by, by this particular guy one well, one of the times i was um i was given a bit of an hard time five taliban handcuffed me tied my legs together pinned me to the floor removed my shoes and uh, socks whipped the bottom of of my feet many many times uh with a hardened rubber hose uh which ended up in uh, damage um at the same time i was being kicked repeatedly in the ribs which ended up with six cracked ribs um kidney bruised kidneys and a kidney infection as, as, as well that was one of the times so they're asking me some really random stupid questions i didn't have any relevance at all um but the guy was very inexperienced the guy who was um interrogating me at that time and to be honest, with you, he was just a bit of a. He, it, it, it was a personal vendetta. He saw me as being British, former soldier. He wanted to hit out at something. I was what he hit 
how I, um didn't actually help me myself a few times because everyone knows you don't inter in antagonize your interrogator i made the mistake of actually telling him what i actually th thought of him called him a little boy at one point i told him during one of the interrogations do you want me to go to the shop and get you some some crayons and i'll use little words so you understand it that got me a kick in i felt good about it because it pissed him right off but i thought if you're going to give me an hard time boy you're going to get it and all so uh, yeah did you ever fear that you would be killed honestly yeah i thought there was a couple of times the one that might want to um sort of execute me there was one of the times where i told me interrogate if you want to kill me to do it at least have the balls to do it yourself take me outside and you can shoot me at the and in the back of the head but you got to do it yourself if you want to talk the game you're going to be able to do it as well again he had a bit of a meltdown and i got a kick in for that as well why didn't they kill you? Not sure. I'll be on. I'll be. I'll be honest with you. Um, but I've also got some um, some connections out there as well. So once my connections actually realised it was me in that underground interrogation centre, the beatings and the ill treatment abruptly ended, and I was trapped amicably for the next couple of months while I was actually in there. Um, all, all of us were given a bit of an hard time we, we all got told at one point we're looking at a 40 year prison sentence in that cell or we were going to be taken outside and, and hung um, so a couple of boys didn't handle that well there was five other British nationals who, who were actually in that underground facility as well and one American all of us deal with things in our own way um being a former soldier i've got a very dark sense of humor so i just thought well they haven't killed us yet you roll up your sleeves you crack on with it if you go the other way and think oh my god i'm going to get killed tomorrow every day you fall apart then you 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 you're no good to yourself then you're no good to anyone else as well so in in that sort of environment you're literally just you stay switched on, you roll up your sleeves, you keep a sense of humour and you crack on with it. What sort of food were you getting? Rice. A lot of rice. You must have lost a lot of weight. <laughs> I went in, I was 98 kilo. I came out, I was just over 70. So, but I put a bit on now because I've been eating everything inside. You're making up for that? Yeah. You're a tough bastard, mate. Your mindset is tough. Like that's where the cream of the crop when you're, you say the British are the elite they are the elite because up here there's something wired up wrong I miss with like a lot, I know a lot of the Scottish past like special forces courses as well because they're a little fucking tough but like, when you look at the British from the army they're such they're so tough that like every man I've interviewed that's been in the army on this podcast you can just see that they're, they're tough you can also see a, they're broken as well with the things that they've seen the things that they've achieved mm. but the toughness the mental toughness like like you could have went in anywhere and you'd have survived but just because of that something in your mind that just doesn't make you break like where did you get that from like the, the that toughness like no nothing's breaking me was that come from a kid or is it as you got older i think it i think it yeah i think it came out when when i was a kid because i was quiet when i was at school i was one of the shy ones um not very confident when when i was at, at, at school as well but i just thought I think I think I've always had it. I think I got it off my dad, me mum as well, me grandma and me granddad as well. It's just you don't give up. Nothing's impossible, and this too shall pass. Doesn't matter how bad a situation you're having on one particular day. The next day could be a hundred percent better. So all you do is you crack on with it. Plus. I'm a little bit arrogant, and I think that's because I was in the Paris. I think you've got to be a little bit arrogant and believe in yourself to throw yourself out of a perfectly serviceable aircraft. It ain't the natural thing to do. So, and I think that being a little bit arrogant, it works well. And when you're in very dark life and death situations, you've got two choices. You can either curl up in the corner, cry and die, or you stand up, you roll up your sleeves, you just give them a big smile and you get on with it. 
And I told all the guys I was well was with, the other British nationals, I said, how you act right now at this moment in time will be how you will be remembered for being in here. And a lot of the guys saying, how can you be so upbeat all the time? They might take us outside tomorrow and hang us or take you outside and torture you again. And I went, yeah, and? No point pondering on it. It's going to happen. It's, it's, it's going to happen, is it? And I told the boys, just remember how you act now. In a year's time, after you're out, after you've been released, you'll look back at this and go, yeah, I handle that, I handle that well. So the way I, the way I, I look at any situation... I've ever been in and I've got no regrets at all because if I ever changed anything in my life it wouldn't have made me the person I am now.